when you are free diving in the years prior, there is no risk. You don't have any other gas in your lung than what you are breathing. The only risk is come short of air, and then you're in trouble, which happened to me uh, one time, seriously. So- Tell um, me about that time. I gotta ask you about free diving before we return to the rebreathers. Well, all these legs I had altitude, they are cold. They are at the minimum temperature that you can have on bodies of water, uh, clear bodies of water, which is four degrees C. It's very, very cold. And so you can It's cannot, like an ice bath. Yeah, somewhat, yeah. So you cannot- um, just dive with a wetsuit. So the idea was to take a uh, dry suit. And I learned how to free dive with a dry suit, which is really the worst thing you can do. What's a wetsuit, what's a dry suit? So a dry suit, uh, a, a wetsuit is usually what you use in the ocean when it's not too cold. You can use also a dry suit, but the wetsuit basically is going to keep you warm because water is getting into the suit and at the contact of your skin is getting to body temperature. Mm -hmm. And so for a while you can, you know, dive like that. And in the, in the ocean here, that's fine, that, 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 that's fine. The dry suit is the opposite. It's completely closed, which means that you don't have any contact with the water outside and you keep your warmth through uh, your body temperature and, and even clothing that you can put into it. So these uh, dry suit, they are used by diver who go really deep in very cold water and need to stay a long time uh, underwater. So what's the bad part? The bad part is that when you have those uh, uh, dry suit, you have a lot of air that can be trapped in it. Usually we do what we call burping the suit. It's not a very pleasant expression, but you get in the water, and as soon as you get in the water, you can see the air pockets mm -hmm. all over the place, right? So you burp the suit, you open the valve, mm -hmm. and the air comes out. Once you have done that, then you look with your uh, lead belt, and, and, and you know when you're ready to go down. And so what happened that day is that I actually did burp the suit, but didn't realize I burped it completely. And so I went down, and immediately I felt an air pocket going to my legs. So basically air was trapped in the suit and went on my legs as I was diving like that. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't pay too much attention to oh, that. Because like you're diving down? Yeah, I was diving down. And so didn't pay too much attention about that uh, as I was you know, busy, uh, just an awkward position. But um, then I wanted to turn and go up. Well, no can do. I was just like a buoy. Oh, wow. And I, I was like that. So I, the first time I say, okay. I try a second time and a third time. And by the fourth time, I kind of realized I was in trouble. And the fifth time I say, okay, now you better give it your best try. Otherwise, it's going to be big trouble. Um, so and you're, this is free diving? I was free diving. And then you can't. And I cannot turn What were you around. feeling? I mean, is there a panic or not? No. There is no panic because you can't. You cannot afford to be panicking. In fact, you are always thinking because there is training. And this is the best part about training. Your training allows you that space to keep you cool mm -hmm. and, and composed, which you need to be in that kind of situation. And so finally, after the fifth time, I was able to rectify the position and get myself up. But when I got up, my lungs were empty. I had been in the water for quite some time. And I of course I knew I, what was going to happen. So I decided to just be the plank, you know, not move and don't do anything. Just open my mouth and try to suck oxygen. But obviously, oxygen at 6,000 meters, 20,000 feet, there is not that much. It's about a little, it's a 48% of what you breathe at, at sea level. So although it was noon at that time, the sky stayed pretty dark and starry for so about a minute stars or two. Everywhere. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> oh, uh, the funny God. thing was- And that's the first time you experienced that kind of, uh, I mean, do you can you possibly train for that? Like, because uh, can you also pass out? 
Oh, you could. I mean, the, the fact that I was already seeing dark was a real sign that my brain was starved of oxygen. And I had one of my uh, uh, friends or colleagues on the, on the shore just telling me, because I'd been under for a little while, and say, is everything okay? <laughs> and I, I, I remember trying to say something. And nothing. And, and, and I was just like, oh. that's, I think, the best lie I ever, ever. <laughs> I get maybe the thumbs up. You were lying to the friend and maybe to yourself? Uh, no, uh, because <laughs> I knew I was going to be okay. But it took me to be still for fun. a few minutes. Well, can you talk about free diving? I mean, what's the technical skill involved here? It, it just seems... Um, it seems exceptionally difficult. Like for most people that swim, you go underwater, it's, 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 it's hard. So what, what's the skill there? You know, I think you probably can get good or better at free diving by training. So you have different techniques. Uh, you can train in swimming pool and you can say, you know, frankly, for me, um, I go at the bottom of the swimming pool and I sit there. And, and then you have relaxation uh, uh, techniques some people meditate. I can't. I am not a good person that can meditate. Or if I do, I don't know about it. And uh, But um, my way of doing things and, and taking my mind off the situation I'm in is by singing in my head. I, I love music or hearing music. And in fact, knowing the kind of song I'm singing, I know about the length of time that I'm staying underwater mm -hmm. as well. So this is how, you know, so this is my own way. People have different ways. What kind uh, of music are we talking about? All sorts of music. Can be classical, can be pop music, and you know, just songs. When you really know that you are relaxed and something I experienced actually at 20,000 feet, which was the greatest experience of my life uh, in, those, in those terms, is when you forget that you have water around you. At that point, uh, you cannot tell whether you are the water or water is you. There is actually no separation anymore. And I felt that uh, when I was training in the swimming pool, I never could have imagined that I would feel that way once uh, on top of uh, that volcano. And it happened. And it was absolutely amazing. It was, you know, we were talking about how life consciousness permeates the universe. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, on that volcano, that day, it took me by surprise. I was not expecting it. Everything around me, the lake was Arctic blue mm -hmm. with all the ray of the suns. You, can, you could tell them apart, every single one mm -hmm. of them. I was surrounded by golden darts. And it was the most incredible experience. And I don't know if it's that kind of environment that led me to just, you know, go into whatever state of meditation or whatnot. But all of a sudden, there was no separation anymore between me, the water, the volcano. And if I came with questions, they didn't matter anymore because for that fraction of a second, it seemed that I had all the answers of the in the universe. Was it the connectedness with everything? Is it, what it, you can call it that way. I still don't know what it means, you know, yes. literally. But it is that moment where you feel that it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter anymore. It was a absolutely absolute peace, absolute understanding, and it was incredible. It was a, an absolute uh, awareness. Could you describe it as beautiful? That would go beyond that. I think that there is clearly in my mind today no words that can express how perfect this was. It, does that start to speak to why you love diving? Or is, is there something special about the, that place, diving at such elevations and volcanoes? You know, I started diving pretty much, this is the first thing I did when I was near water. In fact, there is a very fun little incident with my parents, me being on the shore of a lake on vacation. I was three years old, maybe. And I had these little lifesavers you know, on my arms, and my parents were not watching. And in my little brain, I still can remember today, saying, well, nothing bad can happen to me. I cannot drown if I go underwater. See, that's the logic of a three-year-old. Yes. Yeah. It kind of so, works. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, well, pretty brilliant. You know, so I removed the lifesavers that I had, and I just went in the water. My mom said before she could do anything, I was under. 
And it was like a natural thing. And for me, I felt immediately at home. And, and, and you know, as Such little as I was, completely. And it goes beyond that. You know, this sense of connectedness or oneness or whatever, I, I always felt good and, and uh, underwater. So it doesn't matter really if it's 20,000 feet. The, the thing that matters at that point is that you need to get there. So you need to get with all the gears, with your hiking, trekking equipment, high mountaineering gears. And when you get on top of that, you have to remove all that and don a suit. Is there something uh, you can speak to the challenging aspects of that process? Or is it just like this rigorous process that's well-designed that you have to go through and you don't think one we are step humans. at a time? This is where most of the risk is because you can be well-prepared, but for one reason or another, you get sick, you know? And you can get sick not only because of a high-altitude sickness. It can be a number of things. Uh, or you can be tired, or you can catch a cold. And then, of course, you have the mountain itself. 